Hello everybody, my name is Angus Phillips and I'm Director of the Oxford International Centre for Publishing at Oxford Brookes University. Uh, today I'm delighted to be in conversation with Mike Shatskin who's talking to me from New York, so thank you very much Mike for joining me. Uh, perhaps Mike, I could just st start by asking you, I know you're a very ex experienced commentator on the book industry, perhaps you could just tell me in a few sentences your, your career and relationship to book publishing, thank you. Well, I was born into it. Uh, my father, when when I when I was born, my father was a uh, production man at the Viking Press in New York. And by the time I was a teenager, he was a, a very important executive at Doubleday, which was growing like crazy. And he was a he was an innovator. He 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 broke molds and invented things and thought about the business in a very fundamental and basic way. And I sort of learned it from him. Um, my first job was. Uh, 1962, when I was 15, I worked on the paper on the brand new paperback department of the Brentano's Bookstore on Fifth Avenue, in New York, because the Brentano's Bookstore reported to my father, so uh, I was able to get that job, and and that was that was the first exposure. But then um, after the McGovern campaign, which occupied me for most of my early 20s, I went to work for my father. In a, in a service business that did production for publishers and then distribution for publishers and worked for him for six or seven years and learned the business. So I describe myself as having been gainfully unemployed since 1979, <laughs> which is when the family business went away and I had to start figuring out how to get paid. And fortunately, I knew a lot of people in the business through my father and um, and through my work over the last few years with two continents at that point. And I knew a lot about a lot of aspects of publishing. By then, I'd already written a couple of books. I wrote a book on the New York Knicks basketball team in 1970, and I uh, got credited for co-authoring a book on practical jokes with my friend Peter Funt in 1979. And um, so I'd, I had author chops, I had edited, I had edited books, um, I'd sold books every way they could be sold, knocked on all the doors. I'd been a bookseller. I'd been a production guy. All of these things I'd learned at my father's foot, but I, but I, but I knew them. So I was able to um, start consulting mostly the small companies at that point, looking for distribution with larger companies, which was something that was beginning to happen more then. It's a, it's a, it's common now, but it wasn't common then. Um, and then in the late 80s, I got involved with John Wiley when they were expanding their trade operation. And that introduced me to the world of corporate uh, clients. Um, and then in the 90s, I got involved in what we called electronic publishing um, at the time and started to stage the first conferences about electronic publishing, which we, is now more elegantly referred to as digital change. So I was in on the digital change thing as early as you could be um, and rode that for a long time as a, uh, someone who really understand the publishing, understood the publishing business and therefore had some um, useful views about how technology would change it. So I think, I think that pretty much summarizes it. The last, uh, since the 90s, I think the digital change piece has been the most important piece, but um, distribution in general, and marketing in general, and using dig, uh, digital tools, all of those things are in my bailiwick. So what trends have you seen in publishing over the last few years? Well, the biggest change, I think, is that publishing keeps getting bigger, which any way you measure it, right? There's more titles, there's more sales, um, there's more books being read, there's more books being found, but that part of the business, which is controlled by commercial efforts, by which I describe, I would describe them as uh, financially, commercially responsible, right? Some of it is about publishers trying to make a profit. Some of it is publishers, like academic publishers, they may not be particularly trying to make a profit, but they're trying to operate within rational commercial bounds um, while they have other objectives. That part of the business is becoming a smaller and smaller part of the total. And the, to and the total is swelled by millions of self-published authors and 
um, and various opportunities to monetize backlist. And of course, the other thing that's changed is that where the books get sold. Um, it, you, you know, 25, 30 years ago, it was almost all in bookstores. And today it is more, well more than half, not in bookstores. So uh, that means that the bookstores suffered. So that there was a, so the commercial publishing entities are getting smaller. The commercial retailing entities are getting smaller, but the total business is getting bigger. And that is a paradox that is um, the nature of publishing has been for the last 25 years and I can't see how this stops. So you think that trend's only going to continue? I don't, yeah, I think that, I think, you know, we have, we have a big five publishers in the United States, big five commercial publishers. It'd be hard for me to see more than two, five or 10 years from now, um, because the number of books that require or that can benefit from a high commercial treatment. Commercial treatment means you really bang the drum for the book, um, the day it's out and the day it's out it's on sale in many many places and you're looking for that big first week or two sale that's going to make the book coat you know ride the for that from that period on going to break it out of the pack and make it something that's visible and there's just fewer and fewer books on which that makes any sense and those tactics don't make any sense when you don't have lots of bookstores so What's happening in the area of bookstores? What's happening to the chain stores, for example, in this environment? Well, the chain stores, oddly enough, um, in some ways are the most challenged because what makes a chain work is that you can make, well, first of all, uh, scale, right? So you're buying, you're buying books for many stores, so presumably you get a better price. You're buying books for many stores, so presumably you can afford a more sophisticated uh, buying department that is more informed about what's going on. Um, but on the other hand, um, bookstores, stores, it used to be, and not that long ago, we're, we're both old enough to clearly remember this, <laughs> that if you wanted a book, what you did was you went to a bookstore and you looked for it. And chances are, if it was a bestseller, you found it. And the chances are, if it wasn't a bestseller, it didn't. And then, so the stores had ways to order you the book that they didn't have, special orders, uh, scop orders, uh, things that don't exist anymore, where you would prepay for the book and then they would mail it directly to you when they got it. Um, well, that went away. I mean, nobody, nobody would shop for a book like that anymore. You go online, you find it. If, um, and maybe you order it, or maybe you confirm that it exists, and you go to a store and buy it because you read it, need it right now. But that's the other thing. How many books do you need right now? Very few. Most times, if you want to read a book, you don't care if you start it this afternoon or a week from Wednesday. So it's it's really not something that you're compelled, like, like the butter that you need to complete the dinner that you're cooking, which you have to go out and get and bring in because you need it right now. Books are never like that. So it's really perfectly okay to have somebody ship it to you and you're going to get it in two days or five days or whatever it is. That, the combination, oh, and the other thing that's changed, that changed retailing. When I, in the early 1990s, when superstores happened, there were maybe a half a million books available. Um, in print. That, I mean, not counting used books, but half a million books that publishers were ostensibly able to ship you a copy of. And the biggest bookstores had 150,000 books in them. So of the total of half a million, a third of them might be in a big bookstore. That was a massive number. Well, today, Ingram has 18 million books in their database of which they can print one and just give it to you tomorrow. They have a million books in their warehouse, some of which overlap the 18 million, but some of which don't. So there are 18 million books available where there used to be 500,000 books available, but there are no bookstores that carry 150,000 titles anymore. The most any bookstore carries today, probably 40 or 50,000 titles. So the chances of anything except the bestseller 
being where in a store, if you look for it, are minute. It's not going to happen. So what that means is that the independent store, which curates in a way that is interesting, that has um, that finds particular things that the that the that the store owner or the store customers are interested in, creates an opportunity for serendipity and community. Um, that is it, that chain stores. It's much harder for them to do now. I'm seeing what I'm seeing, and you guys can tell me more because you you know from Britain. Daunt seems to be saying that the inventory from Barnes and Noble to Barnes and Noble is going to vary a lot. That the that the you will not see the same books in the first the next three Barnes and Nobles you walk into. That's good in the sense that it keeps you. It means that if you shop one and you haven't found what you want, there's a reason to go to the next one. So that's a good thing. But it's a lot harder to manage that than to manage stores which are all the same. So, um, so I would say that the independent entrepreneurial bookseller um, has more has an opportunity to carve out a space for themselves, and they're going to have more and more opportunity to carve out space because the chain proposition is really, really difficult to make work. And independents have been doing better in the States, haven't they? I mean, they, uh, they've been having a hard time here, but they, the numbers have been rising in the States. Well, I think the big, the big thing there is that borders went out of business. Yeah. You know? So in 2010 or 2011, um, I would say you probably, when borders went out, we'll guess 30% of the shelf space. Uh, I mean, a lot of shelf space, right? So, so all of a sudden, there were neighborhoods that had been, uh, or areas that had been very well served by Borders, and they didn't have a bookstore anymore. And that created opportunities. And at the same time, by the way, Barnes & Noble re kept reducing its, its footprint, right? So superstores were common for Barnes & Noble at the beginning of the century. They don't, they're not that way anymore. They don't put 150,000 titles in them anymore. So the combination of the reduction of, of borders, the reduction of shelf space in Barnes and Noble meant that it opened up opportunities, even in a market that was shrinking, it opened up opportunities for the independent bookseller in the States. And Amazon's opening up physical stores now. Is that going to carry yes, on? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Amazon has physical stores and um, they have, they have, well, they have physical bookstores and they have other physical stores and they also have Whole Foods, which is a, um, a, a supermarket chain, and I haven't noticed any books on sale in the Whole Foods up the street from me yet, but I'm sure that that will happen. Um, Amazon, uh, Amazon uh, is in, it, it's interesting because when Amazon, when you order a book from Amazon online, they don't care whether that book is in a warehouse or in a store. They know where it is, and they can ship it to you from wherever it is. So the books that are in the store. Are this are an inventory for the for the mail order exactly the same as the books that are in the warehouse and not in the store? So Amazon is simply taking advantage of the opportunity to take some warehouse that had been some inventory that had been in a back room and put it in a front room and have it and make sales with it and be able to sell other things with it, which they do. They sell prime memberships. And, you know, they don't just sell books in their bookstores. They sell you ways to interact with them over and over again. So they don't have to make the same money on the retail establishment. Yeah, I would expect, it hasn't happened, but I would expect there to be a lot of Amazon bookstores before this decade is over. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah. And what's happening with ebooks and audio in the States? Because here, audio is growing very strongly. Um, and uh, ebooks were supposed to hit the, hit the top of the curve, but uh, obviously with the pandemic here, ebooks have had a resurgence. But what what's been going on the last few years with ebooks and audio? Well, audio is surging because it has become digital, right? So what's happened is we in the last ten years we all have iPhones or smartphones, and those smartphones. And so before twenty years ago. You, audio was famous for uh, you listened to it in your Walkman when you were running or you listened to it in your car while you were commuting. But you had to have your Walkman or your, or your car in order to make it make sense. And you, had to, and you had to have the cassette. You had to 
somehow in the physical thing. So there were a bunch of barriers between you and listening. Those barriers are gone, right? You've got, you've always got your phone. Your phone is always able to connect to deliver you an audio book um, for, for free if you want through Audible or for you to buy, uh, just like it's available to, to give you an ebook. So I, I think that's part of the surge um, with audio is that the sheer ubiquity, the sheer availability of it has driven a lot of people to discover it. Um, and people are listening to more things on, they're listening to podcasts on their phone that didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago. So what's the difference between, I, when I walk around the streets of New York, I'm listening either to news TV, right? Or podcasts. I don't actually, I've never really gotten into audio books, but I'm always listening to something while I'm walking around and it could have been, it could have been an audio book. Um, ebooks hit, e, e, I, John Ingram just explain to me what happened with eBooks. And he's absolutely right. When we, when they first started to happen, 2007, eight, nine, people got a Kindle, right? Or they got an iPhone and they got an eBook app. And they thought, this is great. And they started buying eBooks. And then at some point they figured out, you know, I got 14 books on my phone I've never read. I don't need to buy any anymore. So their buying slowed down to the thing which would they would immediately read. That's why we saw what we thought was this huge surge. And then we saw what we thought was this flattening or declining. What it was, was a filling of the pipeline. And, um, and, this, and, and John's observation about this was that it was similar to what happened to publishers in the early 90s when the superstores happened. And suddenly Barnes and Noble and Borders were building all these stores where they put 150,000 titles in them and they'd buy all this backlist from the publishers to put on the shelves of the stores. But they weren't selling all those books. They were filling a pipeline. So three years later, when it, you know, they, they decided, why don't we ship back everything we haven't sold a copy of in the last two and a half years? It was a lot of books and created a lot of returns. Well, that was the, it's, it's much more costly to reach the filling of the pipeline in physical than in digital. All it means is your sales slow down. You don't have to take any inventory back and you certainly don't have to process the returns. Mm -hmm. So people still reading eBooks, do you think? Oh yeah. yeah. I, I, I read eBooks. That, that is how I read. Yeah. And, and no, I think lots of people are reading eBooks and lots of people are reading exclusively eBooks. It's just that, that you don't, there, there are people who tried it and quit, but there are also all those people who are reading them now are not buying them at the rate that they bought them when they first started. That's the key. Yeah. In new, cust new customers, a, a brand new ebook public customer or a brand new audiobook customer will fill a pipeline. They may only want six titles in there, but they like the idea that they have the next thing that they're going to read or listen to available to them. Um, but then at some point, you know, you don't need 50 books in your pipeline. But do you think the printed book's going to survive through all this? Yeah, well, it's going to survive partly because of print on demand, right? If, if print, part, printed books, uh, printed books are thriving at the moment because, uh, because lots of people read them. And but there are a lot of, it, it's a very important distinction, I think, to make. When you, if you're talking about video or audio, there is no difference between, it doesn't matter how the, the, the uh, signal got to the device. It goes in your ears or it goes in your eyes. And however it got to the place where it goes in your ears or eyes, whether that was digital, whether that was a physical thing that you loaded, it's a, it's, it's a matter of indifference. It makes no difference to you at all. Whatever's most convenient is what you want. It's the same experience. Printed books are a different experience. And it's a, and it's a different experience that some people really prefer to a digital book for any number of reasons. They're tactile, they're easier on your eyes, you like writing in the margin. You like flipping forward a few pages or flipping back a few pages. There are all kinds of reasons why it might be preferable, um, aside from the fact that that's what you've always done. That's another reason. So, so there are all kinds of reasons for printed books to be persistent. 
And now that you can print a copy of a book for, to order, um, which Ingram does thousands, if not tens of thousands of times every single day, and Amazon does too through Create Space, then now you don't even have to maintain inventory anymore. You just have to have the book loaded in case anybody wants it. So under those circumstances, I think printed books are going to be around, well, I'm 73. I think they'll be around longer than I will be. <laughs> I know you do a lot of work in the area of climate change as well. Have you got any reflections for the book industry in the light of what the work you've been doing around climate change? Any thought, reflections on, on book publishing? You know, the, 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 I don't really. And I think there are, you know, there are some people that felt that uh, printed books were wasteful of, of, um, of resources. I mean, there's a certain, I don't think it has anything to do with climate, frankly, uh, although trees absorb carbon and you chop down trees to make paper. So maybe, that, maybe that's the argument. But, but, the, but the paper industry has always grown its own trees, right? And the paper industry has never clear cut a forest to make paper. Paper, paper creators grow their trees and they and they harvest them and it's a so it's a perfectly sound ecosystem so I, I what i've found about climate change is two things one is the carbon is going to kill us so we got to tax carbon we've got to do everything we can to discourage the burning of fossil fuels and throwing co2 into the into the atmosphere because it's going to end human civilization in 100 or 200 years if we don't do something about it and the other thing is we have to stop closing nuclear power plants. It's nuts. Yeah. Every time we close a nuclear power plant, every time we burn more fossil fuel. It has never happened any other way. The nuclear power plants constitute an inflated danger that is not real. And is, with the exception of Chernobyl, which is a plant that would never have been built except in the Soviet Union and represents the failure of the Soviet Union, not of nuclear power. Except for Chernobyl, nobody's died from nuclear power. People die from coal and oil and particles in the air that are from burning them every day. So, so that, those are the two things, taxing carbon and saving nuclear, which, have, which seem to me like the two top of mind concerns for somebody trying to save the climate. And neither of them have much to do with the book business. Yeah, they're not directly relevant to the book business. Yeah. And so we're talking in the middle of a virus pandemic um, and countries are in different stages of lockdown. Uh, how is the book business holding up in a time of corona? Well, you know, it's really interesting. I think the book business in, is holding up very well, as near as I can tell. Um, I just saw an announcement, I think, in the last couple of days that Random House has decided nobody needs to come back to the office till September. Um, and, and I think, you know, and New York is supposed to begin to open up next Monday, June 8th. So um, I, I think, you know, amazingly enough, there's a lot of things in the book business that we can do without being in the same room. Um, so, so the product, so the acquisition of books has continued. The production of new titles has continued. The sales, of course, have migrated even more to online because there, there, are fewer, there are fewer opportunities to buy in a store, although even that's beginning to come back a little bit. Um, so I, I'm, I'm actually quite, I think people in the book business are pretty lucky compared to people in most other businesses uh, in terms of how we're able to weather this, at least here. And there's the supply chain held up? Well, no, yes and no, okay? It's been a massive opportunity for Ingram. And, um, and in fact, I, I wrote a piece on this uh, recently. Ingram has a category of uh, book uh, of, of sale that they call PTO, print to order. And what that means is yeah, you're a bookseller, you order 10 books, they got eight of them on the shelf, two of them are in lightning print on demand, they don't, they're not on the shelf. So they print those books, PTO, print to order, and they merge them with the other eight that were on the shelf and ship you the 10 books tomorrow, right? So the print to order does not require the publisher to get the book to you, right? to get the book to Ingram. Ingram, all they need is a digital file. That has become really important because the publishers are having problems keeping their warehouses open. 
They're having trouble keeping their warehouses staffed. So they're doing things like, we don't want to ship you one of this and three of that. We only want to ship you cartons. So Ingram is able to manage, uh, if you can just ship me the print file, right? I can, I can fill a, an order for this book for one copy or a thousand copies. And that has, that has been a part of the supply chain that has, um, that has really come to a sort of a moment of glory in the pandemic. And um, of course, Amazon, Amazon also suffered a bit because they were overwhelmed not by books, but by everything else that they had to deal with. So that's opened up a few more opportunities for other booksellers to sell direct, to sell online. And once again, that all comes to Ingram. So, you know, Mike's bookstore uh, puts up a web page and everything's fulfilled by Ingram and they ship it in a box that says Mike's bookstore. So all of, all of this is, as, as it, it was really um, perfect for them. Um, and they are a big enough, powerful enough company that they have been able to almost single-handedly maintain um, important components of the supply chain. Um, I think most people can get the books they want and um, and get them pretty quickly. Not not necessarily in a store, but I think most things are still available. And you've seen previous recessions, and uh, we likely heading into a global recession now, already in, in one. Um, how does the book trade generally fare under these conditions? Well, the, 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 the legend or the mythology all my life is that books were recession proof. And that for all of the people that fell out of their ability to read books because they got a little poorer, other people fell into their ability to read books because they got a little poorer and they couldn't, they couldn't take a trip to Paris or whatever. So they ran a book instead. So the, 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 in, in, in my 50 years in this business, the, the mythology, I really don't know the data, but the, but the theory has always been that books are pretty recession-proof. I think they're proving pretty recession-proof this time. And of course, it, it can't help hurt that there's no theaters, there's no movies, there's no ball games. There, you know, in other words, all sorts of other things that you might do instead of reading a book are now not available. So that so aside from the cost of, and the recession and people's economics, there's a practical uh, element, which is it's easy enough to still get a book and you, and you don't need anybody else's help to read it. Well, that's great. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, I think you've answered my question. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's been and, a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for the opportunity. And stay safe.